Hey, many believers are pretty convinced that America, it works on a two-party political arrangement. You've got the right and the left. You've got a dominant left party and a dominant right party, and we all lived happily ever after. They're concerned that a religious right group will rise into power, and they will enact coercive laws, ultimately resulting in the enforcement of something called the mark of the beast. Now, this is at least partly mistaken, because you see, America does not have a major right political party. What we have is a very extreme left political party, and then we have an extreme left political party. Those are the two big ones. Now, pretty soon, two-party systems begin to function like a single party. And so they agree on the big points so that it's always a win for the people that want the big things. And then on smaller or lesser matters, they tend to have some small disagreements. The left-right paradigm obfuscates that at this moment in time, Christians have more to be wary about in the present wholesale replacement of Judeo-Christian values and the descent of our society into a soft totalitarianism. Almost under our very feet, the nation has changed. Well, in, in 2017, Rod Dreher wrote this book, The Benedict Option. We are thrashing desperately in the midst, he says, of liquid modernity. Liquid modernity is when change occurs so rapidly that it's difficult to get a, get a stand up on anything. It's difficult to get a grip on everything. Things are just changing so fast. Things don't have time to solidify. And it's difficult not to concur with Dreher's kind of gloomy assessment of Christian prospects in our world today. Listen to this quote from uh, page 8. The light of Christianity is flickering out all over the West. There are people alive today who may live to see the effective death of Christianity within our civilization. By God's mercy, the faith may continue to flourish in the global South and China. But barring a dramatic reversal of current trends, it will all but disappear entirely in Europe and in North America. This may not be the end of the world, but it is the end of a world, and only the willfully blind would deny it. Now, Dreher calls his response the Benedict Option, and he says this is not an escape from the real world, but a way to see that world and dwell in it as it truly is, to bear with the world in love and transform it as the Holy Spirit transforms us. The Benedict Option, or I'll call it TBO here, TBO, he says, changes the way Christians approach politics, church, family, community, education, our jobs, sexuality, and technology, unquote. So Dreher gleans ideas from Benedict of Nursia, whose approach gave staying power to the monastic system, which was founded about 1,400 years ago and continues to this day. So there is obviously some staying power to it for all of its good or bad pieces. Now, not too many Bible Protestants, none of us are really interested in picking up pieces of Dark Ages Catholicism, and adopting those kind of medieval practices. But that's really not what Dreher's about here in his book. He sees Western Christianity as in a state of decay and that it's, it's too late even to preserve it. What he suggests is that Christians preserve what we can, do what we can to preserve a Christian way of life, and we build kind of a parallel society. We've got this society, and we would build a parallel society in parallel to it. Listen to what he says here in his book. We in the modern West are living under barbarism, though we do not recognize it. Our scientists, our judges, our princes, our scholars, and our scribes, they are at work demolishing the faith, the family, gender, even what it means to be human. Our barbarians have exchanged animal pelts and the spears of the past for designer suits and smartphones, unquote. And then he, well, how do you especially identify these barbarians? Well, again, he's, he says it this way. Barbarians are people without historical memory, released from all authoritative pasts. They progress towards barbarism, not away from it, unquote. And look around yourself. Statutes, historical accounts rooted in a Christian worldview. Uh, those things are being taken down today, de-emphasized, de destroyed. And today's thought leaders are erecting a secular technocratic utopia. And clearly, Christians haven't been invited to this new civilization. The old civilization must be destroyed so they can build their new one. But it's not really a new project. Listen to this quotation about the 1870s to the 1930s or so. In America, from 1870 through 1930, these elites worked what sociologists Christian Smith terms a secular revolution. It pushed religion to the margins of public life, advocating science as the primary source of today's values and as a guide to social changes. 
Within Christianity, it replaced the religious model of the human person with a psychological model centered on the self. This was a fundamental shift in what America was. And the high priests of this new era were not the clergy, they were the scientists. Virtue and the transcendent were replaced with the pragmatic and the scientific. And so humans are now understood to be the product of an unintelligent, unguided evolution from single-celled creatures into an upwardly evolving intelligence. Our civilization has been remade with a fatal loss of the transcendent. And again, he comments on this fatal loss of the transcendent. For the first time in history, the West was trying to build a culture on the absence of belief in a higher order that commanded our obedience. Instead of teaching us of what we must deprive ourselves to be civilized, we have a culture built on a cult of desire, one that tells us we find meaning and purpose in releasing ourselves from the old prohibitions as we self-directed individuals choose." Unquote. In the absence of that which is higher than the material, desire becomes supreme. Not the other person is supreme, but what self wants for itself, that's what is supreme. In other words, in the society that's been built, the individual has no higher goal than self-satisfaction. The Benedict Option is an attempt to, quote, build a Christian way of life that stands as an island of sanctity and stability amid the high tide of liquid modernity, unquote. Changes are overriding the world that we once knew. But most churches have already lost most of their distinctiveness. Again, to quote Dreyer, Christians often talk about reaching the culture without realizing that having no distinct culture of their own, they have been co-opted by the secular culture they wish to evangelize, unquote. And he says this in another place, a church that looks and talks and sounds just like the world has no reason to exist. And of course, he's exactly right. One example of this intermingling of the world with worldliness with Christian culture uh, is seen in the destruction of the family and the hedonistic approach to marriage. You know, hedonism means based on desire, just what you want. Dreher says this about the gay marriage issue. Quote, Americans accepted gay marriage so quickly because it resonated with what they already had come to believe about the meaning of heterosexual sex and marriage, unquote. And it's true, a vast shift has, has happened in these last two centuries. So that marriage is broadly perceived as being more about personal pleasure. It's about that more than it's about community or virtue or what you give to your partner. Marriage is about what you can get from your partner. See, that's the way it's working today. So marriage is more about desire. And when marriage is no longer about giving to one's partner, but about what's in it for me, that's when marriage presents this, this hedonistic cast rather than a mutual giving of oneself to each other. And when you go that way, marriage just becomes an optional institution. You know, my marriage isn't working too well for me right now, so bye-bye. And that's where you go. Marriages that are built on giving often are long-lasting and very fulfilling for both parties. Marriages that are built on receiving, what can I take from my partner, uh, those often collapse under pressure. And although there was momentary astonishment, you know, I remember in 2015, we were all rather astonished at what happened. But pretty quickly, we sort of got used to the new plan and it, it didn't shock us anymore. It wasn't too long before most of us shrugged it off and forgot all about it. And Dreher points out what a great challenge this worldliness is to us. If we cannot maintain a truly Christian identity, then we would really have nothing to offer the culture. And Dreher is right, quote, he says in his book, we are on the brink of an entire areas of commercial and professional life being off limits to believers whose consciences will not allow them to burn incense to the gods of our age, unquote. And his advice about employment is also on target. Listen to this. Any job, no matter how benign, that compels one to affirm as distinct from withholding approval of, to affirm something unchristian and untrue is not worth keeping, no matter what the cost, unquote. So if you can't be a Christian and do that job, you shouldn't be in that job. It's just not worth it. And he's right. Now, among the helps and suggestions that Dreher makes for us, he suggests intentionally going out of our way to create a more distinct Christian communities. Again, kind of a parallel, a culture in, in parallel, not in the culture where we are now, but in parallel to that culture so that we can maintain a truly Christian identity without all this secular values coming along and destroying everything. 
He says this, he says, community builds a social structure in which it is easier for Christians to hear and respond to God's voice and in which others hold them accountable if they lose the straight path. So Dreher favors more separation between believers and the world. More self-control is needed. He points out this, he says, quote, if you don't control your attention, there are plenty of people eager to do it for you. The first step in regaining cognitive control is creating a space of silence in which you can think, unquote. And of course, today, what do we have? Our phones are beeping, our tablets and phones and TVs and every which screen we have constantly is trying to feed us new stuff. Got to look at it. Got to look at it immediately. Got it in the middle of the night. You've got to check your phone. It's not helping us be Christians. You know, if we are plugged into a decadent society, we're going to come out looking like that very society. And Dreher's right. Friends, Christians won't have anything to offer if we don't live by a Bible, if we don't live out a Bible Christianity. So I think we should appreciate most of the points made by Dreher and the Benedict Option. It's difficult not to agree that many of us are already deeply embedded in this culture and mostly adrift. Meanwhile, the whole world seems like it's being transformed on rollers into a soft totalitarian techno-utopia. I would recommend Legutko's 2016 book, and I'll link to it up here, The Demon and Democracy. That is a very useful book. It helps us to see why our world is changing. I'd also recommend Dreher's book he wrote in 2020 called Live Not By Lies. That's another very critical book that says a lot more about how to resist these changes. Now, the Benedict Option is helpful, too. Uh, but I find those other two books to be probably more helpful. The immediate picture that Dreher has, and I think that, that I see too, is very grim. What we see happening right before our eyes is a, America is becoming a soft totalitarian situation. What we have left, really, America is already basically gone. We're living in a facsimile of America. And this book may not deliver all that we'd like it to deliver, but it is a call to action. And I want to read from, uh, from right near the beginning of the book, I think it's the best way to end as we think about what this book's about. I have written the Benedict Option to wake up the church and to encourage it to act to strengthen itself while there is still time. If we want to survive, we have to return to the roots of our faith, both in thought and in practice. We are going to have to learn habits of the heart forgotten by believers in the West. We are going to have to change our lives and our approach to life in radical ways. In short, we are going to have to be the church without compromise no matter what it costs. And it's true. If we can want that and move forward in that conviction, God will do wonders for us.